Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> This week on Tales of Tyria, we've got a bit of news discussing a team, another team quitter, team quitter article, and we're discussing immersion in RPGs and MMOs. Stay tuned. Yes, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. You can find us at talesoftyria.com. We are live from the great free cities of Lion's Arch in the Rosewind Tavern. I am Bridger, and I welcome you all this evening. We've got a great show planned for you today. We'd appreciate it if you told a friend about us. Drop us a good review on iTunes. Hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube. It's going to be a great show. So, let's jump right into the introductions. Welcoming back for the first time in a while, Aku. Welcome, sir. And he can't hear. There we go. Sorry, that's my bad. Go ahead. Check. <laughs> it's all he has to say. Good to be back. Representing Team Legacy for us today. By the way, congratulations on joining. Team Legacy, yeah. All right, <laughs> joining us for the first, uh, actually, let's save her for last. We got Kai here uh, yet again, and I can't click the right button, and it goes to the wrong person. There we go. Kai, Hello. welcome back. Hello, thanks for having me again. All right, and joining us again as well, Vega. Welcome to the show, sir. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. Good to see you. I don't know why I'm waving. Nobody can see it, but when you <laughs> wave, I wave. It's just what I do. Hi, Bridger. <laughs> now I went to the wrong one yet again. Hello, me. Now I can wave. All right. If you're not watching this on the video, you're missing out. Uh, but if you're not watching it, listening to it on the audio, you're probably seeing more than you should see. So, welcoming for the first time, Mint Chip. Apparently, the birds approve. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Back welcome. Uh, as I. Let me do it again here in case everybody missed it. There, you have a, you are a, uh, a well-known YouTuber. I guess, is that the term we're using now? YouTuber? I don't know, well-known. <laughs> or did I just make that up? Whatever. The YouTube channel. Yeah, can, YouTuber is what it would be called, but I don't know. The YouTube yeah. channel we can find you on is uh, Mintchip, LOL. And what do you yep. post on there mostly? Uh, video games. I am going to do more Guild Wars 2 videos, but I do EVE Online and Skyrim and pretty much anything that I play or want to talk about. Excellent. All right. So let's jump into the news for today. Uh, we have a couple of different links here and those following along in the chat room live with us. Uh, welcome <laughs> and thank you for showing up. We do like to have people in there to, uh, to point out some interesting questions and stuff that we might be missing and uh, we will keep an eye on there. So feel free to talk to us. There's also a link to the show notes right there on the main page or on the YouTube channel. If you're watching this now, there should be a link in the description uh, so you can follow along with the links that we are watching here. So uh, we do record, by the way, Sunday nights at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. For those of you that are not aware, you can find it on the TalesOfTeria.com website at that time. Eastern Standard Time is minus 5 GMT. Enough. Let's get into it. The top 10 strengths of Guild Wars 2. Now, this is a very interesting counter article to last week's top 10 <clears throat> flaws of Guild Wars 2 that was posted on the TeamQuitter.com website. Team Quitter, of course, a very uh, well-known and respected uh, Guild Wars 1 uh, guild that takes PvP very seriously, and they, they, they're quick to point out that these two articles are from a PvP perspective, not necessarily from a, the game as a whole. So let's jump in and take a look at the article here. A lot of these points are things that we have made on past shows, so I don't want to reiterate things. Um, their first one is there's no monthly fee, which, you know, we have obviously is a great thing for, for us as consumers, not only do they, uh, they have a, a, you know, we don't have to worry about paying the monthly fee. We also don't have to worry about them being in incentivized to keep us playing poor quality game product in order to, uh, to keep us playing or, well, that didn't come out right. But listen to the older episodes. We talked about it a bunch. Now, this is a very interesting point. They talked about how uh, number 10 reason 
for one of the strengths of Guild Wars 2 is love, which confused the hell out of me until I read what they were talking about. They said that the first Guild Wars was made from hate, hatred for all the garbage that other MMOs force you to do, grind levels, repeat menial tasks, etc. Uh, quote, he said that Guild Wars 2 is instead made from love, the ultimate motivator, because the developers finally found a project that they enjoy. Um, have you guys ever, uh, you know, I, I've actually I've heard that you know, creative new groundbreaking things are made from hate. Has anybody else had that experience? Um, I don't you know, know. I mean, I mean it, you kind of, I guess it kind of depends if you try and take what other people have done wrong or, you know, just try and pretty much do everything that they did wrong or did different just to be different, you know? Yeah, I mean... I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> I mean, well, I know if I, for example, take too long to get to work and I hate driving through this traffic, I'm going to try and find a better way. So people, are, people wind up getting motivation to do something about a problem when they wind up hating it enough. <laughs> I think yeah. if instead of the word hate, I think it would, be, it would probably be better if we used the word necessity. <laughs> um, you know, and in the sense of, oh, crap, I'm late to work. I need to find a better way to get to work. <laughs> Let's experiment by driving across this 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 football field. <laughs> so when I think about um, creating a, an MMO that I would really enjoy, I always think about the things that I really like in other games that I wish were in games that are out today. Like for example, uh, you know, I really like how Eve Online has no factions; it's free for all. You know, but I really like that World of Warcraft has a, like a huge base of people who play, you know, I don't know, just things like that. So if you take these little parts that you actually do like from a game and put it in and try to make an MMO that has all those parts that you like, I think that that's probably a lot more progressive than just going off on the things that, that you absolutely hate about MMOs so you wouldn't want it in there if that's what you were originally asking. Yeah, I kind of agree. So I don't think they're doing it based on hate for things. I think they're basically, as you said, it's love. They're taking everything they love about every game they've probably played and putting it all into one game. Instead of spreading a player base across five different types of MMOs, they kind of want to bring everyone together into one game. Yeah. I, I also think that at the time that the first Guild Wars was made, um, you know, they, there were other people making other MMOs, and if you just went and made another MMO that was just like all the other popular ones out there, you sort of just kind of get lost in the whole ocean of MMOs that are out there. So they kind of took everything that MMOs were doing at the time and did the complete opposite. You know, there was no subscription fees. Um, you know, everything was focused on skill instead of time. And, you know, it wasn't something you need to invest your life into. And I think that was what the first Guild Wars was all about. Yeah, and then this Guild Wars is more about taking all these little things from these, like you watch Rift with dynamic events, but they did it wrong. And then you see like mm. mini games and other MMOs and they just didn't do it right. And, and they're kind of like trying to take all these little things that are new and different, things that, you know, maybe some of the bigger MMOs aren't doing and trying to just perfect it in a way that, that would uh, really draw people in. Because right now you can't make an MMO that's just a WoW clone or, or any of that because it just will not, it won't make it. No, no, we saw... That time and time again, uh, War Warhammer Online <coughs> was was basically, you know, World of Warcraft with a lot of systems that I preferred. I, I liked a lot of the changes that they made to the WoW formula, and it still failed. But that may not be because it was, you know, too much like WoW. It might just be because they didn't execute that properly. Um, <clears throat> moving on down the list, number eight they put on there. Again, this is from a PvP perspective, so one of the, the great strengths of Guild Wars 2 that they say is custom private servers, which is something that really we've not seen at all in the MMO genre that I can think of. Can anybody think of any game that allows you to take, you know, small instanced arenas onto a custom, you know, guild server for all intents and purposes and, and customize it and play it and have admins and run it like an FPS game? I can't think um, of any off the top of my head. <laughs> are we talking? Are we talking about like the underground free WoW servers kind of thing? <laughs> I guess, that, <laughs> I guess that's, the really <laughs> that's the only because example. That's the only example. Because there were plenty of those out there. That's for sure. That's true. Oh, I've been and, no, and been they were they were so duty. they were so broken. But you know. Ugh. All right, chat room, come on, help me out. Is there any other MMO out there that's doing this? I really don't think there is. Nobody else in the chat room seems to seems to know either. 
Um, so, yeah, I think that's absolutely a major strength of this game because, I mean, just imagine how many... The, the community that is created in a first-person shooter, for example, where, you know, you can join the same server and see the same people over and over again and have fun, you know, with your arch nemesis who always shows up on the other team and is like, I'll get you next time, Gadget, you know, that kind of a, <laughs> that kind of a deal. So, I, I mean, combine that with the community aspect of, like, an MMO and you've just got this massive machine of community and social possibility. So I'm, I'm very excited about that too. I have to completely agree with that. The number seven is their, their engine, which basically, they said it's, it's revamped their Guild Wars 1 engine. Did you guys, I don't know if that's uh, true. I haven't actually, I haven't found any information about the engine that they're using in Guild Wars 2. Do you know if it's built from the ground up or did they just make the old one better? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I mean, it looks like they just kind of revamped. I mean, it, they probably did. Maybe they started from scratch, but they probably used a lot. Well, and it's not started from scratch, but they probably just worked off of their old engine. I mean, the Guild Wars One engine was beautiful at the time. It was. The, I mean, the it still kind of is. Yeah, it's it still, still it still has a certain style to it that's really good, and I think it'd be silly for them just to not improve on that and try and start from the ground up. Although they have been working on this game for how many years now? So maybe. Uh, too they, many they, years. Yeah. <laughs> two thousand six, right? Two thousand seven, something like that. I think, uh, right after I right right after or right around the time that Eye of the North was released, they uh, they they uh, they started working on it. Number six that they put on here: information from the field, and this is something that they've talked about in a number of interviews that they're trying to really bring the all of the information that you need to know. They're trying to make it visual and very intuitive and easy to understand. If you're if you're if you're crippled. By some kind of you know uh, you know warrior uh, wing clip or whatever they call the you know the the hamstring shot, then your character is going to limp. It's going to be a very obvious visual thing that humans can instantly grasp. He's limping. Okay, he's moving slowly. That's so easy like in, to understand. So like instead of looking in debuffs on somebody, you're gonna actually like be able to see them physically. That's the idea. Like detained. Well, they, they they limped in stuff in Guild Wars One, didn't they? They might have. I don't remember that ever happening in like WoW or anything, though. To, to, to no, not not degree. in WoW. That's for sure. But I, no, I, you I just don't... slow down. I've seen that kind of before, though. In Lord of the Rings Online, if you took full damage, it was as if you'd like sprained your ankle, and you would kind of ah. have to limp everywhere after that. And I thought that was really good because you knew the reason you were walking slower is because you've like taken full damage. Right. So. And, and it wasn't just, you know, knowing what your character's doing. I mean, if you're trying to keep track of what's going on on a screen with, like, three or four players fighting in PvP, for example, then you really want those easy visual cues. If somebody's, like, blue and frozen to the ground, I mean, that's an obvious cue. But there are many, like, spells and things in Guild Wars 1 and in World of Warcraft, for example, that are just very... You don't know what they do. There's no visual cue as to what they do. It's just a box in the top right corner of your screen that says you're taking damage over time or something. And I know that they've mentioned in a number of interviews that they are trying to really make it clear on the screen what's going on. For example, those area of effect circles that you see on the ground. If it's blue, it means that it's something that buffs you. It's a teammate spell that helps you. If it's red, it means it's an enemy spell that's gonna debuff you. It's gonna do either some damage, it's gonna slow you down, it's gonna be something else. And if it's mm -hmm. white, it means nothing specifically is gonna happen to you if you walk into it. So maybe it's a meteor shower from your teammate that's called down, but you won't take any damage. Those three colors make it really easy to understand what are you going to do? Are you going to walk into that circle or aren't you going to walk into that circle? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, I love how much okay. effort they're putting into that. I also, I also like how they're, how they're saying they're not going to have, um, you know, the red dots and enemies on your map and compass and everything. Because mm -hmm. um, that was another thing I hated that, you know, it's not, I mean, I hate, I hate using the word realistic in video games. But, you know, if, if you're mm -hmm. looking at a map. There's not going to be full of red dots, like, oh, there's enemies here, here, and here, like, around you, you know? You have to look at the field. And like someone yeah. said in chat, you're, you're playing the game, not the UI. Thank exactly. you, Sam. So yeah, that's, exactly. That, that's Aku. one thing they said. They don't want you to, sorry, they don't want you to, like, stare at, like, raid frames and be like, this person's taking health. Like, you should be able to see they're standing in something, and they, like you said, they've got a, like, effects that personally target them, and you can see them rather than just seeing on your party frame that they're taking damage. Yeah, I, mean, I hated that in WoW is that uh, I like you look at those videos of you know people doing raids and you have like one little box that like that's where the game is and the rest of the crap is all just full of buttons and yeah. graphs <laughs> and all these things and you're sitting there 
and you you know might as well just play flight simulator just sit there and like hit a button like oh okay it really you is you, that, you might as that. well be in a 747 the number of controls that you have on the screen and dials and, and damage meters and all kinds of stuff but yeah aku let me ask you this speaking of like those red dots on a compass thing i mean in a world versus world situation i would love for there to be some element of sort of stealth and information warfare where knowing where the enemy is is important and I mean let's say Aku you're sitting in uh, you know the bushes or something at the edge of a forest and you see an enemy you know sort of uh, party a guild or something going towards a castle I mean wouldn't it be awesome if you could hide in there rather than just having your name be in like bright red letters above your head yeah I mean um, that gives a very situational or I guess um combative advantage um just by by being able to do that um you know being able to say okay we're going to have a stealth group so to speak go into a uh, go into this fortress wait for them to come in and we jump them without them knowing well there are four people in there uh let's not go in there kind of thing so i think that this whole thing would be very um helpful to at least the pvp scene yeah, I don't know the details about what I was talking about just now, but Camrat points out, you know, you can't see the name if you don't see the model. And that's, that's, that's all well and good, but I'd love to be able to be far enough away to where the name, the name doesn't just pop up and give you away. You know, uh, you could be observing someone, and unless they look for you actively, they wouldn't be able to find you. So that, you know, trying to scan the, the horizon looking for enemies is like an important skill. I mean, obviously, if they're 20 feet away from you, I don't care if there's a red thing above their head because it should be easy to see him at that point. But um, my, where was I going with this? Oh, it's man, like spotting totally... in Battlefield 3. It's like spotting in Battlefield 3. <laughs> I mean, I just love to have that kind of information warfare available. Um, I was, oh, you know what? I, I got to tell you, I am not in the Star Wars Old Republic bait. Are, you, are any of you guys in it by any chance? Me. I was in, for, in it for a couple of weekends. So, I got an invite, but I didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> I I haven't really been super interested. Star Wars is just not my universe. It's not the one that I... I mean, it's great. I love the movies, whatever. Um, but it's not my universe, so I wasn't super excited about it. But I looked at some PvP videos, and damn if I couldn't tell the difference between you know, Star Wars, the Old Republic, and a World of Warcraft raid frames when you've got tons and tons of numbers and, and text and stuff hovering over the screen. I'm like, where's the immersion? I can't... I can't get immersed in that. There's so much going on. That I literally, I, 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 I can't, I can't. There's I no have way to I can't force with you, myself. Like, so much on, on SWOTOR in that sense, because SWOTOR has probably been, like, the most immersive, like, game that I've played in a little while. Like, um, the Narrative-wise, I, I, I agree with you completely. I just feel oh. like at least maybe the customizable UI is different. Maybe the one that I was watching was just specific, but the guy had well, stuff really sure all over saying, his like, screen. The UI in that game or just the UI in general is not so different from any UI. I mean, it kind of gives you like a... All right, that's it. I'm looking it up now. I didn't... I mean, well, I only got to level 15 or so, but I did a few PvP matches... And, I mean, the raid frames kind of were in the middle of your screen, but I did see some videos where people had moved them out of the way and made them smaller. But I thought, you know, for a weekend beta, I can't be bothered to waste an hour trying to sort my UI. But I didn't right. find it too invasive. But I do see what you mean, that, you know, you are finding yourself drawing yourself to the raid frames. And I think your eye kind of just wanders over there, like, what's everyone else doing? But, I don't know, low-level PvP is just weird anyway, I think. It was I, fun. I, I, I had a good time. Well, hold, oh. hold on, hold on, Aku, hold on. Aku, go. Aku, go. Oh, okay. I just feel that if um, if I'm attacking someone and I know that I'm, you know, they're they're pretty close to death, I feel that I shouldn't have to look at a or or either move their health bars into the middle of my screen to figure out what their life their life total is, or you know, play whack a mole with my eyes trying to figure it out. I think that if <laughs> the if the image or the character model is actually you know limping or doing something i don't know to show that they're weakened or in execute range or something that would help immensely and i i, I found yeah. you know i found that i was watching you know pvp videos on youtube for swotor and i not even playing saw my eyes looking towards their health bars <laughs> i i I, <laughs> I don't know well i feel like like pvp is a bad 
example of trying to see if a game's immersive or not. That's like, true. I, felt, I, just I, took I it, felt like, I felt like that, that UI about, is different. They're saying it's immersive because of the yeah. story and you know, yeah, you the story the is really character going through it and it's you know, you can't make a PvP an immersive experience because you know, well, you can, but it's not going to be as immersive as you know, going through a single player story. Yeah, I think the storyline for questing and, you know, how you get your lightsaber and things like that is the, probably the most immersive storyline I've ever played. But for PvP, I felt like it could have been any game. But I don't think people play SWOTOR for the, the PvP. They play it for, I yeah. love the films and I want the story. So Understood, okay. understood. And, and, and I was just judging it from a UI perspective and maybe the single player UI isn't nearly as, like, we should, we should We should probably move on. The oh, absolutely, yelling, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting... <Exactly. laughs> Tales of the Old Republic. Okay, so uh, the next one that they put on there, uh, the game ends naturally, and I think they were talking about the, uh, the, the game type, the conquest game type. So in the first article, he was, he, was, he was complaining about the game type, and now he's saying that the game type is still better than, than some of the game types they had in the original Guild Wars where the game would go on for like an hour or something like that. And I think that's absolutely a huge benefit that, that basically no, none of these conquest games in, in, um, in, in Guild Wars 2 are going to be longer than about 15 minutes or so because from a spectator standpoint, I mean, sometimes watching really long matches of like StarCraft or League of Legends or something can just get, oh, come on, just end it already. I, you know, the, the tension can only last for so long. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. I prefer quick matches because... If you are on the losing end of a PvP match, especially when it's a battleground or like a conquest type, and it can take forever for the other team to get the points they need to win, it's just kind of depressing and you're just stuck there and you don't want to leave because you might get that deserved debuff and you're just kind of stuck there losing, being ganked at a graveyard and it's the most frustrating thing ever. So I personally would prefer shorter matches. And then for something like World v. World, that's something you can invest more time into. <laughs> that one never ends. Yeah. <laughs> so the next one on the list was small team sizes. Again, from a, from a PvP perspective, this is definitely uh, beneficial. I think uh, 5 versus 5 or 6 versus 6 works really well. They chose 5 versus 5 for the structured PvP in Guild Wars 2. I think that should work fine. I think that gives you a lot of flexibility. Uh, I mean... You, imagine how many different team compositions you could have with just five players. I mean, considering all the, the, the different professions and how they could build each other. Uh, I mean, I just, I just could see that being really useful. Uh, number three, they said it's social by design. That's, you know, they, they talk about, you know, the, the hot join PvP being beneficial. They talk about all the different aspects they made to make it easier to play with other people. All of those things. I mean, we've covered a lot of that before, so I'm not going to go into detail on it. But the sidekicking system, um, et cetera, et cetera, those are all great. The second one was accessibility. They said that Guild Wars 2 is going to be very accessible, and I give that, you know, definitely is a huge advantage um, to, uh, to Guild Wars 2. And the final one that they had down here is it's Effing beautiful, man! <laughs> so, and I have it to is. agree, though. I don't know if that's... I think, actually, that ties into their... I would actually put their... The, what, what was their point here? Number six was the information from the field one. I'd actually say that one is, is, would be my number one. Um, and part of that is the fact that the, the game engine is beautiful and it can display that information in a, in a good way. So I don't know, what's your number one out of all the things that you know about Guild Wars 2, guys? What is the number one thing that you think is its biggest strength for you personally? I personally? Yeah, Aku personally. Nine, skill over time spent. Oh, we skipped that one. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I personally believe that if I, uh, if I worked, literally worked my ass off the train to, you know, figure out a way to beat an elementalist or a certain class, I don't believe that a person who raided for 35,000 hours should be able to beat me because they have the best gear in the game. I don't think that in any way should um, determine whether uh, that person has skill or not. I think that the skill should come from them actually playing, um, you know, using your skills at the proper time, dodging skills, you know, all of that. Um, so that's my number one. Absolutely. And I love how they're doing that. Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than actually being able to track and notice that you yourself are getting better at something. And that is why the World of Warcraft style system evolved because it gives everyone the illusion that they are getting better at something. And maybe they actually are, but whether they are or aren't, 
all they have to do is spend time and will get the illusion of the fact that they are getting better at something, even if they may not actually be getting better, more skillful, or even smarter in their way of the of choice of activating skills and things like that. Vega, what's, what do you think is your number one strength of all of the things for you personally? What makes the game awesome? Well, Aku stole mine, so I'm going to have to go <laughs> with... Um, I guess the, the information... From, you also said information from the field, but the, uh, the information from the field in the sense that um, the way that you know, positions are going to play an important role in combat. Mm -hmm. And you're not just sitting there casting, hitting a button, and you're automatically targeted on, you know, someone. I like the fact that you need to move around and you need to get in position. And working together will make that, um, your fighting more effective. I like that a lot because I, I, don't, I don't know of any MMO that's done anything like that, you know? And, you know, some MMO, like, wow, it's, you know, if you're a rogue and you attack someone from behind, you do more damage. But, you know, that's something simple. We're talking about you have a, an elementalist throwing up a firewall and someone shooting arrows through it. Or you have a guardian putting up deflecting walls all over the place and an engineer dropping down stuff. And it's just, it adds a whole new level that I feel a lot of people, that no one has really played before. Yep, absolutely. Kai, what is your, what is your favorite strength about Guild Wars 2? It's probably the dynamic events because I personally started playing Rift and I quit WoW for Rift and I was like, it's going to be amazing, like these Rifts and events are going to be really good and they failed me, like drastically. <laughs> so I'm really, really looking forward to running around, just seeing something, not having to join a group because I prefer to do things solo unless it's like an organized event. So just running around, seeing people and just doing it and being able to do it because it scales dependent on how many people are there. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully seeing my dream actually work properly. All right, Minship, you got the hardest job because now you have to go after everybody else has already taken the good ones. But what's your, what's your favorite strength? Well, I guess mine is probably a mixture of the skill over time spent and the sort of skill shots that he was talking about. I, I don't know, he didn't say skill shots, but I like uh, MMOs that have had those sort of skill shots where you have to sort of worry about your placement and what you're doing uh, rather than just sort of auto-locking somebody and then and hitting them. Uh, the same thing that uh, Aku said? Yes. Anyway, yes. is that? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, about... Um, skill over time spent is I hate having to like farm a bunch of gear like in World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. If I come back into an arena season or something, it's like, oh, I have to get all this gear before I can even play. Otherwise, I'm too squishy or something. And I can't even play competitively until after that. So I'm really excited that they're having a sort of system that will sort of remove that where I can just jump in and play competitively whenever I'd like. So I'm all really right. looking forward to that. All right, so I think that wraps up that discussion of the, uh, the Team Quitter article. But if uh, you were at all interested in it, you can check out the rest of the discussion going on on their forums there. They had uh, uh, quite a number of posts afterwards with people, you know, putting their two cents in. So there's another article, actually, that was posted on Kill 10 Rats. It's an interview, actually, to Kill10Rats.com, and they're linked to that in the show notes as well. This is uh, an interview with ArenaNet's Eric Flanham. Uh, Eric Flanham, I believe, is the lead designer of Guild Wars 2. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that they said in this interview. Basically, the interviewer points out that in a lot, I mean, a lot of the interviews and blog posts that ArenaNet talks about, uses the word iteration probably as many times as the presidential <laughs> candidates say terrorism, you know? So <laughs> then he goes on to talk about, you know, the luxury of iteration. And, and the reason that they say it so often is because so few studios actually get the ability to iterate on something. Usually it's design the thing and then implement it. We don't have time to test it and make sure it works and then change it. It's just you're going to design it, then you're going to implement it, and then you're going to move on to something else. And he said he felt really fortunate to be able to, for example, rework the Rangers pet system because it was okay before, but they said, you know, it could be better. So, I mean, Mintchip, what, what, how, how do you think this affects the way that Guild Wars 2 is going to uh, come out of the gate? Well, I think it's, well, since they don't have like a release date and everything like that, I mean, we're going to get a really polished, finished copy. I think that it, it's awesome that they get to do many iterations and things of what they're doing. I mean, yeah. It doesn't seem like they have a huge <laughs> amount of pressure from, from NCSoft. No, there's no pressure. I can, I, I can kind of relate to the whole iteration process just because, 
I, I'm a design engineer, and me, I want to iterate everything as many times as I can and try and refine it. But my boss is only looking at the dollar signs, and when's that going to be done? When can you send it out? When can I sell this thing? So I think designers like iterating and like changing and like trying to make the best product they can. And the whole reason why bigger game studios don't iterate as much is because they're only worried about the dollars. And, yeah. you know, if, if NCSoft and Guild Wars, you know, if they, you know, yeah, they might be doing a lot of iteration processes. And I, I'm sure everyone wants to play this game, but patience is a virtue and it will pay off. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, I'm the worst, I'm the worst one to speak. I'm so impatient and I literally say that I want Guild Wars 2 now pretty much every day. I refresh <laughs> the Guild Wars 2 site like... Ten times a day. <laughs> Give me my um, maybe there's a new article. Maybe there's a new article now. My F five key is broken. <laughs> well, I think that was one of the things that kind of Rift had going for it was it had a, it had a sort of a complete game when it came out, yeah. and I think that that's something that, you know, Guild Wars two is going to really have, and it, since they have so much time, it's just going to be amazing. I'm really excited too. I'm I'm with Katie on that. This is insane. I can't get too hyped though, because you get too hyped for it, and it's not going to be out for months and months and months, and then you're. Yeah, you got to keep yourself low to the ground, because if you get your expectations Doing Guild Wars too high. Yeah, that's right. Six months in advance. <laughs> that's why, you know what? I got bored of waiting, so I, we gotta, I got to. I, I, <laughs> the thing is, every time I'd see somebody, like after I discovered the game, like may have heard about it, but after I really actually looked into it and said, Gee, this sounds like something I'd really like. Let me look into it further. Now, every new person I come across, I'm like, have you heard about Guild Wars 2? Let me tell you about it, my friend. And my wife is like, oh, they won't be back for another three hours. And uh, yeah. then she got tired. We go into sleep and, you know, she'd be talking about something. And I was like, did you see? I saw this new dragon view. Hang on. Let me pull it up on my phone. And she's like, just stop. Just stop. I don't want to hear anymore. You're going to make me hate the game. So I'm like, there's got to be another outlet for this. So let's make a podcast. All right. <laughs> so that's how so that happened. all these Guild Wars 2 addicts are just coming together to just vent our addiction to each other. <laughs> that's right. And people Absolutely. actually watch this. I know. I know. It's amazing. Um, oh, there was another great point in here. Uh, basically, a really good question. The Based on, you know, iteration means that you have to drop old ideas because you have to admit to yourself they weren't good enough and we're going to do better. So the question was, quote, how do the creators of the less than acceptable designs for Guild Wars 2 handle the change? How is the decision to not accept the working design made? Passionate developers can be protective of their design and ArenaNet seems full of passionate people, end quote. Eric then responded, uh, we have a few common sayings that get thrown around in our design department. In many cases, there aren't things that I would repeat, but in some of these sayings actually have to do with design principles. One of the first things we tell all of our designers is something along the lines of, your ideas are not special or care about your design, but don't get attached to it. To me, by the way, unquote, to me, Bridger, that seems like a really good thing to do. It's super important to get people in the door with the mindset of some of your don't ideas you think that wording is a little hostile? Like, yeah. your ideas aren't special. Like, it just sounds kind of like demoralizing it's, right away. It's, no, but it's it, realistic. It's, it's, it is sort of a realism. It's, it's, it's actually designed to protect you because let's say you get really attached to a design. Like I came up with this oh, and it's awesome. And then they have to tell you, I'm sorry, we're going to go with another one. You would get, you know, you, you might have some hostility towards the person who had to make that decision. Or you might have to, you might resent that decision or something to that effect. But if you are encouraged to just keep in mind the entire time you're making something, this might not be the best idea, but I'm going to try to make this idea as good as I can, then what well, I think, it can be I think when ideas do get shot down, maybe they're just trained to not react and get sad about it, but inside I'm sure they're yeah. But... yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like a disappointment. I'm sure they go home and they're like, oh, guess what happened to me? We're talking to their suicides on the way home. I worked on this for two months and then they threw it all out the window. I but, mean when I yeah. read that line I was taken aback myself. I was like, "Whoa, yeah. Eric, what are you? What are you saying? What are you saying?" <laughs> and, and then, and then, I, and then afterwards, I was like, "All right, that kind of makes sense, you know. Um, you kind of I mean, have, you kind of have to take yourself apart from your work, almost in a way." And what he was saying, it made sense. But I could, I, I think he probably could have said it a little <laughs> nicer. I don't mind the whole like your ideas. I don't really mind the whole like don't get attached to your ideas. 
But the whole, like, your ideas aren't special. Uh, maybe there is a really special idea and somebody comes up with it. I mean, let's not be so... Ala rocks her in the chat. He says, so I feel bad for it. the energy bar guy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there was a guy. That was probably a big... I, I assume everybody. <laughs> My idea is bad. Let's iterate. Oh, man. If you guys aren't in the chat, you're missing out. All right. So, um... Uh, I don't know if you guys had any other thing that you wanted to talk about. Uh, I mean, they reinforced the idea that there's something else coming uh, to replace the energy mechanic and that there, there may be... I mean, so that's, I mean, there's really some big things that we don't know about the game. Obviously, the last class, <laughs> Mesmer, uh, is, has not been revealed. Um, we have the energy bar replacement, which may have a huge impact on the game. I mean, the energy bar did. So if they replace it with something, theoretically, it could have a huge impact on how you play. Um, and, and other PvP maps, we don't really know anything about those. We, we don't really know anything about how the tournament structures are going to work or the spectator mode. So there's still a ton of information to come, and I can't wait to, to see it. So, uh, I don't know. Anybody else have anything about this article we wanted to talk about? All right. Moving on. We'll take, our, our take, a, take a tiny break for the meta moment. Just wanted to point out, if you are only watching this on YouTube or only watching this on Twitch TV or something like that, we've got an awesome website, talesofteria.com. We've got one awesome article on there written by me and hopefully more to come. Um, one's already in the writing stages and we'll see how long that takes to get there. Um, if you're only w listening to this on a podcast, you should know it's also on a YouTube channel. Sound Strategy Network is the YouTube channel you can find it on. And uh, just search for Tales of Tyria on YouTube. You should find it there. So if you want to show it off to somebody, for example, and try to get them hooked on it, it'd be awesome. Uh, just also wanted to point out we have a donation button on the website. If you feel like this stuff is worth some money uh, because, you know, we do do it for free, actually, at a loss, as we were joking about what? before the program. Um, <laughs> so if you want to help us out and pay for it, we definitely appreciate it. Feel free, but again, do not feel obligated. Also want to take time to plug TeamLegacy.net. That's my guild, but it's not just a guild. We're going to try and make it a huge community site. TeamLegacy.net is going to be your location where we're going to have guides and we're going to have articles and PvP news as well as discussion and all kinds of other great stuff. So check it out, TeamLegacy.net. Join us now and uh, you can be there at the beginning. Also, I don't get to say this enough, but feedback at TalesOfTyria.com is, is, a, is a special email that goes to all the hosts. Feedback at TalesOfTyria.com. If you have something to say, if you're like, I don't want Bridger to do the stupid ads in the middle of the show telling me to do emails, then you can send it to feedback at TalesOfTyria.com. And if you give us a good review on iTunes, we may say your name on the show because that would, that would be helpful to uh, getting the word out about the show. All right. The meta Woo. moment is done as fast as I could possibly say it. All right. <laughs> so, this is going to be a very interesting topic because there are birds in the background that will not shut up. Background birds. Okay. Background birds. All right. The round table is about immersion today because for the first time in a long time, I've been playing L.A. Noir and Skyrim and actually really, truly feeling like making decisions based on what I think my character would do, you know, and not, not really, and, and really getting immersed into things. So, um, let's start by saying, I mean, one of the game, the games that people really feel immersed into usually are RPGs, but what do you, how do you define an RPG? I mean, uh, Kai, what do you think? I mean, a role-playing game, how, yeah. and, how is that different from other games in which you play a role? I mean, I'm playing Team Fortress 2, I'm a soldier, I'm killing people with a rocket launcher, that's a role, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I personally see an RPG as something, I mean, this isn't the definition, but how I see it is something that is kind of fantasy based that wouldn't happen in real life that you can imagine yourself being and it takes yourself away from your real life. It's an RPG because you feel a role that you couldn't do every day. And that's how I see it. I know a lot of people see it differently, but you could fire a gun in real life, but you can't be a mage and cast a, sp a fireball from your hands. That's how I see it personally. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Um, so, anybody have a different opinion? Um, Minship, what do you think? Uh, I think a role-playing game is kind of like where you're sort of playing a character in a story that's already sort of put out there for you, and you're going through it so you can feel like you're that person in that story. And, uh, yeah. All right. So, Vega, does a role-playing game have to involve some kind of choice, or can it also be 
a linear narrative a la the Final Fantasy series. I mean, you don't get any choice in that game. Aerith dies. You can't prevent it, right? <laughs> so, Spoiler. Com oh, oh, don't no. make me cry. Oh, don't no. make me cry. It was such a sad moment. But, but um, I don't know. I guess it, there's two different types. There's, compare that to know, Days X, for example. You have, yeah, I mean, well, you have... You know, I it, it kind of depends on kind of gamer you are because me personally, sometimes I like having sort of the story laid out, and I don't. Sometimes I don't like having to make decisions because I get overwhelmed. <laughs> like like Oblivion and Fallout Three, I, I still haven't beaten Skyrim, but there's just there's so much to do and there's so many things to decide about that sometimes it gets overwhelming, and sometimes it's nice to have that, you know, the sort of linear. You don't really get decisions, but you're going through the story and you're still kind of living as that character. So it's more of, do you want to live as a character or do you want to build your own character? Mm -hmm. It's hard, isn't it? It's like, it's like those games where you are a character. So, Aku, what do you think makes something truly immersive? Like, what elements need to be in something for you to get sucked in? Huh. Let's see. <laughs> Hmm. I've been immersed in a wide array of uh, different types of games, so trying to, I guess, bottle what the essence is from, from all of those is going to be kind of interesting. Um, one, I think it has, to, it has to pull on some sort of heartstring, either that being um, a, a very riveting story element or it could be some sort of competitive, uh, competitive scene or competitive heartstring. It just needs to it needs to pull the player in a, in a certain way that they're just compelled to keep playing. Um, and specifically in RPGs, I've usually found that, um, that I guess for me at least, the gameplay is what really drives me. Um, and it really immerses me in the, in the sense of, oh, wow, if I do this, I can do this better. Or if I do this move first, I can, you know, set up for this move. And for some reason, for me at least, that really, immers that really immerses me. Um, but for a lot of other people, they usually say, I would, a lot of people have, have said storyline is one thing that is hugely immersive. And, you know, you've got games such as Fallout, Skyrim, you know, Final Fantasy, even on the linear side, all have great storylines in, in their own way. And... I, that just pulls people. So I would probably have to say it's the story or some sort of heartstring. Yeah, for me, I'm feeling like it's got to be consistency. That's the word. Like, I've had a lot of time to think about this, and I kind of dropped it on you. <laughs> like, <laughs> here's a really super deep topic I wanted to condense into a 30-second answer. But the, from all that things I'm thinking about, what makes Skyrim awesome? What makes... L.A. Noir so compelling to me? What makes Left 4 Dead, even though it's a multiplayer game, what makes that so immersive? And to me, it's consistency. If the world feels like it's all internally and externally consistent, that <coughs> makes a huge difference. I mean, if you're in Skyrim and things, you know, you're walking along and there's some guy that hands you something and says, you hold on to this and I'll be back for it. If you, if you sell it, or you lose it, I'll kill you. And then later on, some guy, some hunter follows him up, and, and he's like, I'm looking for this guy. And you, one of the options is, is this your helm? I mean, that's, that's a, a form of consistency. The world makes sense because that guy's hunting that felon. It's not just you just random encounter. Um, but lots of other things in that game really feel consistent, uh, and, and everything feels like a real living, breathing world, like it was all created by somebody that knew exactly what they were doing and crafted in such a way that everyone understands. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's always been consistency for me. So, Mintship. <laughs> it says, are we going to talk about Guild Wars 2? <laughs> what do you think? Let's talk about All MMOs right. then. What makes an MMO a really immersive experience? Has there been one that you could really get into it and feel like, I'm this character, I'm this shaman, or I'm this pilot in Eve, for example, and, and, and this is what my pilot would do? In Eve, yeah. Eve is really immersive. But I think Guild Wars 2 will be really immersive. It seems like a really immersive game. <laughs> <laughs> quick to criticize but then you have nothing to say <laughs> I like huh? to talk about these broad topics because they, it does apply to Guild Wars 2 but sometimes I mean right now we don't have a whole lot to talk about Guild Wars 2 I'm trying to stretch out the shows so that we have information to talk well, about each I'll, week I'll, I'll, I'll I have a question then is there any oh sorry I'll, well 
I think Guild Wars 2 will be... See, in an MMO, I, I, I look at something like WoW as not being immersive because, you know, they give you a quest, you don't got to read, just go collect stuff. But in Guild Wars 2, you know, with the dynamic events and you affecting the villages around you, like if centaurs are attacking a village and you save the village, now that village is there. So it, it kind of draws you in and it pulls you in and it, you feel like you're part of the world. Where, you know, in something like WoW, I always go back to WoW because that's what I had the most experience in, you know, you kill those centaurs in the field and they just keep around respawning and nothing ever changes. So you, don't, you never really feel like you're part of the world. You just feel like you're this thing in it as opposed to being this thing shaping it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, in terms of Guild Wars 2, um, even outside of the dynamic events and, you know, the storyline, I would say um, a good part for me would at least be the dodging system. Um, for, for example, um, you're in WoW, you got this new piece of gear, great, you now have 8% more dodge. So you now have a, a, a basically a percent to dodge. But in Guild Wars 2, your dodging is based on you. And I feel that because of that, that kind of gives some sort of immersion in the sense that, all right, well, I could have done better that fight because I um, probably could have dodged more. Or, and then you practice more and you practice more, and by that alone, you kind of are being immersed in the game just by, just, just by practicing and becoming better yeah, at the game Yeah, you have more itself. control of the outcome of, like, a fight or something. Like, it's you and your own skill kind of carrying you rather than, like, the game's... Um, a math problem. Yeah, yeah the math yeah. problem of the game. So the, having the control RNG. over your character's destiny really makes a big difference. Yeah, I mean, well, not necessarily it's destiny, but just an outcome of a battle sort of right. thing. Like he's saying, like you dodge or whatever, it's you. You have to do it at the right time. It's not, oh, I'm so glad my character dodged there. Good thing I have that 8% <laughs> to dodge. So as, yeah. I think <clears throat> the way that I would put that then is, is having the consequences of your actions matter. Perfect. You know, like a like a quick time event, okay, hit the button to not die. That doesn't feel like the consequences of your actions mattered because your action was just hitting a button. It didn't like, you didn't move out of the way and then shoot them just as they were coming around the corner or something like that. You didn't come up with that idea and then execute it using the controls of the game. You just let it happen through a cinematic. That's a very different feeling than actually being immersed in an environment where you are fully in control of your Possibly, character. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean... And I just thought of a great example for my consistency argument. I mean, we just talked about, you know, Aerith dies, and then everybody's standing around. Why didn't somebody go, who's got a phoenix down? You know, in that universe where everybody dies in every battle. <laughs> and, then, and then somebody dies, in, and then they go, well, guess it's dead forever. It's, it's, it's a very inconsistent, and it's a jolting experience. And so, based on everything I've seen, though, ArenaNet seems to have a gift for creating a really concise and consistent world. And the dynamic events, in my opinion, are, are, are one major step towards that. I mean, if you have consequences for your actions, talk about consequences for your actions, that's dynamic events right there. I, I'm kind of interested to see what they're going to do with this whole, you know, home instance that you're supposed to be able to have. And, like, you know, how they were saying, you're going you're gonna to have to make decisions that affect that you know, like how, I know that they're saying, you know, it's going to feel, you know, like you're shaping yeah, you everything little, around you. Because I'm a little worried. I don't need to interrupt you, but I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little worried that, like, that's not going to be as, like, epic as it's, they're kind of letting yeah, it that, on that, to be. That, that's, what I was, that's what I was thinking, is that, you know, they make it sound really good, but, you yeah. know, how, how much can they really change? And how, you know, like, what are they really going to do with it? Because, you know, they, they just touched on it, and everything in a broad perspective sounds fantastic. Yeah. But the, the, the whole, the, the, the grit is in the details, and what they really end up doing with it will be interesting. All right, so yeah. let, me, let me ask Kai, are there any things that you can think of off the top of your head that really break immersion, that really jolt you out of the game? I mean, we used the, the Phoenix Down example about an inconsistency, but is there anything you can think of that you were really enjoying something, and then all of a sudden this happened, or, or something else about, some, about a game really jolted you out of it? Um, I think it's just really to do mainly to do with storyline. If you're kind of following a storyline, you think, yes, this is unique to my profession, class, or my race, and then you realize that everyone else is really doing the same thing. I just, mm. I hate that 
the thought of that every single person is doing exactly the same thing and you can't go and then tell your friend like oh my god I did this amazing quest you need to roll this class because you get to do this awesome quest if everyone's doing exactly the same quest lines and stuff I think that really breaks immersion for me and I feel like I then once I've got to max level I can't go and try out other quest lines and that does put a downer for me whereas I think for Guild Wars 2 because you've got the skill challenges and the trait acquisition and various dynamic events they can all be different depending on what level you are when you are in that area where that dynamic event is. I, I completely I didn't even think about that but that's a fantastic point that the realization that you're just doing you're killing the exact same boss that 30 other you know groups have killed in the last hour and it, it doesn't you're not special about it i mean that's that's part of what it, being in an mmo usually is it means you're trying to be a hero that's part of the immersion is you're special the other guys are just the grunts the soldiers on the field and you're special because you are x a sorcerer or you know a great warrior or what have you and just the knowledge that everybody else around you is doing the exact same thing and you're not special that breaks you right out of that immersion of being yeah. the hero of the story it's really I think that's like, with Guild Wars 2, one thing they made just said they wanted to make it feel like you're important, and Risa has been said that specifically, and I think mm -hmm. that was one of the main things that made me want to play it. I was like, I want to feel important. I want to play this game and, <laughs> yeah. you know, run around and The self-centered like part hero. of me said, that sounds like a fantastic ego boost. <laughs> I, I agree I, with you completely, though, and I, I, that was from the, the ArenaNet Manifesto, I think. She yeah. said, you know, we're trying to put... And that, I think, is is the main portion of that is the the... The, the personal story that you were talking about before and the home instance and things like that, uh, it really does mean that you have a personal experience where you make choices that matter and nobody else in your party is making those choices with you. So that should at least help reinforce that part of the immersion. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's going to be a, like a certain amount of choices. Probably won't vary too much, but... Yeah, you can only have so X amount of different random choices you could possibly make you can't have one for every single player that's in the game so obviously someone's going to be doing the same thing as you so, yeah but the, the, <laughs> i was going to say that the thing that breaks it for me is once you start getting into that whole like grinding um gameplay like in world of warcraft you know you're playing through the story you're loving up your character you get to the end and you know you're you're working to go do a raid but you're running the same dungeon 50 times killing the same guy 50 times. And to me, that sort of breaks the immersion a little bit because now it's, it's almost a chore. So, you know, I, I, I know that that's, that's inherent to any MMO because you're going to have to run things over and over again. That's just the nature of the beast. But I like how in Guild Wars 2, you know, you could do the dynamic events to get gear. You could do world versus world PvP. You could do regular PvP. You could do quests. You could do all these different things to better your character you're not forced into if you want to raid you got to do these dungeons and so when you when you could do different things it, it kind of helps you stay within the world and not feel like you're just shoring around as opposed to you know doing your what you want to do so it seems to me that one of the biggest problems with really creating a very immersive experience is convenience for players i mean for example um in, 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 any, in Guild Wars 2, for example, we've got fast travel, which is super convenient. But how do you immerse yourself in a universe where you can just teleport places? I think one of the ways that you can kind of explain this is that the Asura gates. They're sort of, you know, magical technology that lets you teleport from one place to the other. When you hit the fast travel button, you can assume your character is going to the closest Asura gate and then teleporting to that, you know, city or what have you. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one way that they have written in an explanation for a convenience feature that would otherwise have broken the immersion. I mean, how is death handled in games? In, in, in... <laughs> pretend it's a guy in a wagon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> exactly, pretend it's a guy in a wagon. Thing. I mean, so death in games is often, you know, just, okay, you try again. Like, there's no explanation for how your guy comes back to life. You know, in World of Warcraft, it's just like, well, death never actually happens because you just turn into a ghost and then come back to life for some reason. There's no explanation for that. But there's a been a couple of games that have some really <coughs> fantastic explanations for that. For example, uh, the first one that comes to mind is the Prince of Persia Sands of Time game. When you die in that game and then you try again, you hear the character who's been telling this story 
say, no, 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 wait, that's not how it happened, right? So it was actually your death was him telling the story and getting it wrong. And then he goes back and tells the story correctly with you actually succeeding, right? That's a fantastic way, just a tiny little thing that makes the game more immersive because you get rid of that inconsistency with how come the death didn't just happen there. Um, so, and another great example, uh, Unreal Tournament games, they explained the you know, respawning mechanic as this is a sport and they perfected the ability to trap someone in a quantum state like right before they die and like teleport them back to life you know, somewhere else. And, and that is actually death for the purposes of, of that game. So what do you guys think? At Guild Wars 2, we know that people just come back to life at waypoints. What would make that less immersion breaking? Nothing. Uh, Nothing. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I, I feel like there, you have to draw a line somewhere in MMOs with immersion because you can't take you can't have an immersion experience like Skyrim or other RPGs that that's what they do. That's a whole story that you're playing in MMOs. It's you, you're gonna die. You're gonna come back to life. You're gonna fast travel here. You're gonna do this. So you, eventually, you have to draw a line somewhere saying that we we want it to be fun and immersive, but you can't have everything be immersive in an MMO. It's just, right now, I think it's not something that's possible. I do agree with you, but, I mean, one of the major gripes that I have that breaks my immersion is when I just saved someone who is, like, this yeah. icon. I just saved Thrall from, you know, a thousand dragons, and I go to talk to him, and he's like, thanks for saving me. By the way, can you go and kill some boars for me? I'm like, wait... <laughs> How was you just? I just had this epic quest to just save you, and you want me to kill boars now. I think that right there would break my immersion in terms of just like almost inconsistencies in the story or just inconsistencies in general. So just making the the NPCs more aware of the things that are happening around them, and not having them stay say like really stupid things. Like was there? Um, there's there's got to be some quests in Skyrim that have something to do with uh, you know. I don't. Oh, that's right. Somebody did a little a rage comic about it, where you know they're trying to join the companions, and the guy's like, "I don't know if you're tough enough." He's like, "You just saw me kill a dragon. <laughs> I just did it right now, and now you need me to prove how tough I am." Oh, yeah. I mean that. That just having. I mean that's a lot of work, though. I mean, how many NPCs are there, and how many different scripts could there possibly be, and how many different you know voice acting overwork? But if you could pull that off, that is super immersive to get them to be super aware of what's going on. And I, and I have to agree with the point that you have to draw a line somewhere when it comes to immersion, because if you have to, I mean, but some people actually like that line in different places. I'm sure as soon as the developer's kit comes out for Skyrim, for example, somebody's going to make that mod where you have to eat, you know, every six hours or your character starts to, you know, get weaker. <laughs> you know, you have to sleep, otherwise your character gets weaker, etc. So those kind of immersive experiences are very immersive, but they're also a trade-off for convenience because now maybe what you want to do is go kill a dragon, but what you have to do is travel to Whiterun because you're out of food, you know? So. I, I like the middle ground. I, like, I feel like, <laughs> like, like, like WoW had nothing and Skyrim is, is good. I want it somewhere in the middle. I like it. Well, I don't want to be forced to go to the bathroom. And I don't want to have to just never do any bodily function. So Skyrim's perfect in the middle there. We sleep sometimes. But, I mean, I think, <laughs> wow, well, I mean, in my, in my regards, you know, it did have some sort of immersion outside of the actual game in terms of the social aspect. Um, you know how many times I would have, like, four of my good friends and we're just like, you know what, we're going to take over Hillsbread or we're going to take over South Shore. And for hours, we're just taking it over. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And dancing in the Two street. hours have just passed, you know. It's just like that's yeah. immersion in itself, too. And that's – and typically that actually has nothing to do with the game other than it brought us together. So. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we're, we're right about at our time limit here. So uh, we're going to wrap it up. Any final thoughts, uh, Midship? Any final thoughts with regards to immersion in MMOs? Nope. Okay. That was easy. <laughs> I like this. We're staying on time. Uh, Kai, any final thoughts? No, that's pretty much it for me. <laughs> All right. Aku. No, you got the last word. <laughs> Vega, any final thoughts? Bring us on. Uh, no, I, I already gave my final thoughts. <laughs> All right. And now for my final thought. Death in games is... That was my, that was my Jerry Springer. Um, so I guess with that, we are, uh, 
we are out of here. That was uh, good being on time, basically, guys. Uh, I appreciate uh, you guys joining me. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you that are still listening and or and are watching, uh, drop us a line and let us know. Uh, do you generally favor more immersion or more convenience in your games? So that's the question of the week. You can send it to us on on Twitter. You can post on the uh, on the web page, the Tales of Tyria page, or any place else you feel like sending us a fe uh, feedback at talesoftyria.com. We'd truly appreciate it. Let us know what do you like, what don't you like, what do you want us to talk about? We haven't got any requests for things to talk about. Send us some suggestions. What do you want us to hear us talk about with regards to Guild Wars 2 and or MMOs in general? I am Bridger, signing off. Have a good night, everybody. See you guys. Good night. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I mean, I had stuff I wanted to talk about that was kind of like involved in what we were, what you had bring in your up. notes or whatever, but you it never came up. So. Come on, you can bring it up. It never came up. Take it, tell it now. It, like, no, no, it's fine. This is the after Excellent. hours what, part. Once, once they, once they release more info on either the next class or even just more like concrete info, we'll have more stuff to talk about. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely. I feel like I feel like lately they've been kind of quiet with a lot of. You know, like there's little things here and there, but in terms of like big announcements, it's been a while since we've had one. Yeah, I haven't had Great bust into my room and say, "Did you see the new update?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Kramer. <laughs> I found the uh, the link I was looking for. By the way, this is the this is the cover by. Oh yeah, Makula. this was so good. You saw this? Yeah, this was awesome. I just want a, like a, a lighter, just to go back and forth. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm out of here. Have a good one. Have a good one. Take care. See you later, man. Nice meeting you again. Nice meeting you, Midship. Hope to see you yeah, soon. Yeah, nice meeting you again for, for the but, first time. I mean, for the first time, for the last time. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to come up with... Uh, Have you guys done a thing? I know you did something where you guys were doing, like, devil's advocate about, like, um... The things flaws. that you're not gonna like about Guild Wars 2 or whatever, but have you done like stuff where you think that, like stuff that you're kind of disappointed? Because I have stuff that like I thought was gonna be about, like I thought Guild Wars 2 was gonna have, but then it didn't have it and made me really disappointed about it. Such I'm as? disappointed that it's not out yet. That's, <laughs> that's my break. <laughs> yeah, other than that one. I'd be that really disappointed if we don't like, get in the closed beta. That's the only thing I'd be disappointed about. <laughs> No, I'm talking about like actual like game, game mechanics, play, right. game mechanics, game stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I really like the concept of the dynamic event system, but I wish it went a little further. Yeah. I actually had. I a wish there were like world PvP. I wish that um, yeah, that there were more skill shots. I don't know. I don't know what I want. I actually had a friend. Um, he mentioned to me. He said, "So you know." The you know he was we were talking about the classes in general and he said you know the necromancer has you know his death shroud and you know the elementalist has uh, you know like four different you know aspects so to speak. He said you know and he's poking fun at me because he knows I love the ranger class. He's like there's nothing special about the ranger. I'm like oh my god I want to be a ranger too. And there's nothing kinda, really special about it but I know it's gonna be OP as oh heck. come on there is something special it's it's like a it's like a trapper class I mean you set up traps and you pull yes, people it's into special. it it's, it's never it's been a done very before tricky. ever. <laughs> he also has a little bit of. I mean, there's, a, there's. He has the ability to go stealth. He's the only other profession I know that has the Wait, ability a to stealth. Stealthing rangery class. He can stealth, oh, that but has only. Never been done before. I think he can only stealth if he's uh, standing still. But it's still yeah. pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, that's never been and done then, before. Either. And I actually kind of thought. I said, well, that's kind of interesting. I mean, the what the ranger is in Guild Wars Two has been done before. Um, yeah, but. I'm, it's still but. Gonna... And you know, and then another thing he all, and then I thought, oh wow, well, what about the the, the warrior? You know, outside of it being the class that can use the most weapons, and it having, I guess, a fifth move can uh, attach to those weapons. It doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily bring anything new to the table in terms of the warrior class. So it was pretty interesting. What I, I considering he brought that up, but then I was just like, well, rangers can tame sharks. I don't know any game that can do that. <laughs> That's true. Can you put laser really cool. beams on their heads? I'm really interested in seeing how they kind of homogenize it. Like, I know some of the... I don't know if they're going to, but a lot of the time... I don't know. I'm really interested to see if it's going to be as, like... How they're going to approach balancing, especially for competitive PvP. Yeah. I, I've, I've said this before, but what I would love to see, but which I don't think I'll see, is really huge events, like dynamic events, that take place once and never happen again. Like oh, some that kind would be of awesome. like like I've yeah, I mean, because said... like if you looked at Rift or whatever, they had a, uh, you'd have like water elementals like coming into the town or whatever, and that was exciting, you know, the first time, and then it like repeated and it reset, and I think like after like four or five months of playing Guild Wars Two, you're gonna see the same events. There's no way that you wouldn't. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if they can keep it really fresh. Like, they, they claim that they can keep it really fresh, but I don't even think they've been playing their own game long enough to know if it would be, you know, fresh enough, or if their algorithms, their randomization of these things are going to be consistent enough to be able to sort of pull forth that, that sort of, um, oh, I'm leveling a new character, and I won't see the same thing this next time. 
Yeah, I mean, they mentioned that they've got tools that can make dynamic events pretty easy and quick to do. I just... I just love if they had like one team of like four or five people that were dedicated just to making single shot dynamic events that would happen well, and then that way about, you would be um, like able to say I was there man when this happened and I, I was the I was one of the only you know 100 right, people right. that were there and then it never happened again it would really s speak directly to what we were talking about earlier where when you realize that you're the you're, you're the 600th person to kill this particular boss just yeah, this week you yeah know? i get it mm -hmm. well i mean that's really difficult to do i mean i know eve online does stuff like that because they have actually like their developers come into the game and will do like a huge you know uh fleet combat battle there when like they have an expansion and the storyline is you know perpetuated they're actually controlling those things so then you know the people in the game are fighting that it's never going to happen again because it's those people like the developers are actually playing it and, yeah. and that sort of thing happens so but i did i did read well i'm you probably read it too because whatever but the thing about how like you can find little dynamic events that like in a cave or something and like that somebody else might never find and activate because they're not activated until mm -hmm. somebody goes and does something right. about it i love that idea i mean it's neat I, we'll see because, I mean, eventually it could be just like, oh, you know, Mancrick's wife, he's over here, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> sort of thing. Like, go get the orb in the cave, and it'll start your little event or whatever. So, we'll see, but, you know. I, I'm I mean, guessing... after everything I've seen with Guild Wars 2 and whatever internet has done, I have complete faith in them. I think they'll, I, I, you know, I think they'll literally have... Never it. have complete faith in anything. I'm an atheist, so I don't have faith in everything, but I do have trust in ArenaNet <laughs> based well done. on well evidence. Done. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... You should always be skeptic. skeptical. Skeptical, exactly. Yes. I listen and... to the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Mm. They teach me. <laughs> um, but I think it's important, like, for the people who are playing Guild Wars 2, like us fans and stuff, to really, like, be a voice as well you know if we have some like not to just blindly suck their dicks like to be like hey this thing here you know isn't a, like we don't like it you yeah, know something exactly. like that so that we can actually like give good feedback not just praise them until they're exactly i mean i'm guessing and i've seen people chest. say what are you talking about when i get to level 80 i'm gonna go back and play all the dynamic events i'm guaranteeing you maybe 15 percent of the dynamic events or maybe 20 25 percent are going to be really memorable super interesting things is my guess i mean I'm, I'm maybe it's a low estimate maybe i'm underestimating on purpose so that i don't get disappointed but, yeah, but then think about it on the other in the uh, the other way too. Like when I start a character in WoW, I know exactly where to go. I know how long it's going to take me. I know where to go to quest. I know how to do all this stuff. So when I need to get to the place that I want to get to, I can do it. I mean, could you imagine like in Guild Wars Two, it could become irritating eventually, like where you're like, oh, where is an event? Like, <laughs> or just having to do these like same events over and over again. I don't know. It'll be think, it'll be interesting. But I think that'll come with time, though. Um, that I, I'm actually saying I'm. I'm writing it down that that will eventually come in time um but i mean you know that just has to you know that's just i guess pressuring the the developers into you know constantly taking more or taking more time to put out more content yeah. or just you know you know and, and you know um get, you know that can be said with the original guild wars with you know how i think what was it every four to six months they came out with a new a new expansion i think I might yeah it was wrong pretty it was pretty rapid which which was so, i mean and if they're going with that same that same style of um, production, and I, I don't see, I don't necessarily see myself, you know, becoming bored in right. the sense yeah. of... I just, I've just seen a lot of people saying, oh, dynamic are events are going to fix everything that was wrong about quests, and I don't think that's possible, because no. dynamic events are going to fix a lot of the problems that we had with quests, but it's a system, and the system is not going to fix the problem that there were a lot of boring quests that were just not interesting. Well, just leveling in general is boring, yeah. you know, having to... I mean, look at the, what's that one game? This, there's a bunch of games now where it's like you don't have to level at all. You just kind of like go through the story and you do stuff and you can PvP and things like that. And you um, skill up your character. Like and even in EVE Online, like you don't, you don't level, you, right. skill, you get skills, you, spe you, know, you specialize. Right. And uh, I don't know, I kind of wish that Guild Wars had done something sort of like that so that I don't have to level to 80 or whatever. Yeah, you can have it. It's going to be rough. Drive this. Leveling is awful, but it'll be fun, I think. I, it's I just, very new and different. I feel that leveling can be fun if done properly. Um, 
and usually, you know, I usually have a, a group of friends or I'm in a very, you know, awesome guild or something that just makes the leveling process just less, m more memorable and less of a, all right, well, 10 more levels till I get my skill shot kind of thing, you know. Yeah. So. But, I mean, I could say the same thing about WoW. Like, the reason I would, uh, I, I play WoW, I still play WoW, is just because of the people that I play with. So, I mean, like, that's, when a game is relying on the people that you're playing with, like, then you can't really say that the game is good because people, people can carry any game, really. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think I had something to say, but now I can't remember what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Mine headphones. Um Oh, just my point was that I mean there are very there are a few super memorable and interesting quests that I remember from World of Warcraft. The one where you have to hunt down the white lion and in, in the barrens, that one kind of Ekiaki. sticks with me. Ekiaki, yeah. People I mean, remember yep. the name. I know like every quest in the yeah, I know every right? quest in the game. But I mean those ones are super interesting, but the ones are just like, Hey, we're being attacked by kobolds, maybe you should help thin out the herd. Like that's super boring. There's only like four quests with the with the coal car. The coal now. car. Really? They got rid of a whole bunch of them? No, they didn't get rid of them. There's the coal car bracers quest, which was really tedious back in the day because the bracers never dropped. And then there was the um, Vol. Is his name Volcar or something? Like the guy that uh, you had to like kind of spawn, so you had to kill a bunch of them so that yeah. he would come out because he'd get angry. <laughs> uh, there was one that chained off of that. Uh, and then there was the final one where you kind of like defended this little town, and that was actually a cool quest because there was a they'd all appear, and you'd have to, and that was that was kind of dynamic back in the day. I mean, back in vanilla, and that was kind of that was something that I'd never really seen in an MMO before, which is where they had all the little mobs spawn right then, and then like everybody could kill them, and you could get, and the way they made it like a group quest was basically because he was a, he had a banner, and anybody could pick up the banner, so it wasn't like, anyway. <laughs> But that was, I mean, and that was back in, flip in 2006 or whatever, whenever that game came out. So I don't know, I, I, like I said, I like it when, I like it that Guild Wars has taken stuff that they think is good and then made it better. Because there's a lot of good things that happen in WoW, there's a lot of good things that happen in Rift, and there's a lot of good things that have, have, have happened in a lot of MMOs that have come out, and when, you know, somebody kind of goes at it and tries to make the perfect MMO, I think that that's, that's awesome. I mean, it's not... I, don't know. I mean, I, I kind of see where you're going. Um, you know, you know, World of Warcraft was a was a stepping stone, um, in terms of this. I guess you can call it the grand staircase staircase of MMOs. Um, you know, and it, that came from you know uh, EverQuest, the original EverQuest. So you know, it worked on things that EverQuest, you know, at the time maybe didn't have the technology nor the, I guess the manpower to do that. And WoW stepped up to the plate and did it perfectly. And then, um, well, you, you know, and then the next game, and you know, I guess Guild Wars is just the next step, and and I'm everything. Saying, I, I would never say that Guild Wars Two is in any way going to like kill WoW. Or I think it's there to just complement. It's supposed to be the other MMO. I think. I don't I, think that. I think that that's actually one thing I've always I always take note of when a new MMO comes out is. I always try to take note as to what the community is saying in terms of whether it's going to be a wild WoW killer and whether the company itself try to kind of alludes to this this wow killer esque mentality. Um, Rift, right out the bat, one of their advertisements said, "You're not an Azeroth anymore." I'm just like, "Wow, that yeah. is a blatant, you know, I guess a blatant step on wow." And in terms of Guild Wars too, I haven't necessarily seen anything. If anything, that they're in, in terms of anything that they're trying to, I guess, put down, they're really saying, you know, a lot of MMOs nowadays, such and such happens, we're changing that, you know. I haven't really heard anything uh, in terms of them attacking a certain game or a certain company, so. No, I don't think so. Um, there's there's too much different about it that it's not really trying to kill... Wow, I mean, Guild Wars 2 is going to have to battle the same thing with people don't really like change. I know everybody's like, oh, I hate WoW, and everybody hates WoW. But at the same time, it's like people are going to be like, oh, I like what I'm familiar. I like what's familiar, <laughs> but they don't know that yet. You know what I mean? Like people are just stupid sometimes. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Like I think that just like how Guild Wars was with Guild Wars, or I mean with WoW, I think it'll be similar. Guild Wars 2 will just be like this other game that can hold its own, will have its own uh, fan base and stuff. But I don't know. Yeah. Stuff in the background. Scary. 
I don't know. I'm excited, but it's not my perfect MMO, though. Not yet. They, no one's made my favorite MMO, except Eve gets really close. I don't know. You PvP, right? I, that's, that's my main thing. Yeah, me too, so... I mean, yeah, it's not my main thing, but... I like free-for-all, like free for all, no factions. I hate dual-faction MMOs. I don't like... I like death penalties. No one likes death penalties anymore. World PvP... That's my dream. I yeah I was I was a huge world PvP -er, even in the sense I mean I'll even consider old school Alteric Valley world PvP in the sense of like the battle lasted five days kind of thing yeah um well did yeah, you ever I, play Astron's Call no I never have oh that was such a, that was like the best game but in terms of just like world PV that's I, I in terms of PvP I mean I'm all for structured PvP and arenas and all that that's that's fun to do but my main thing is. I love world PvP in the sense of being able to, um, you know, either on my own, if, you know, it's just an off hour or something, go out into that field and, just, you know, I see someone there and, you know, shoot a couple arrows at them. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, even on the greater scale, you know, having a guild or having a team or whatever, just, you know, band together to say we're protecting this fortress or we're going to assault that fortress. I think that's just amazing. So, and they're in there putting it in this game with the world, the world, the world. So, <laughs> I don't necessarily yeah. know how they're going to call like that. Well, okay, for example, I'll, I'll explain to you, like, a little bit about how Ashron's Call was. Um, Ashron's Call was, like, if your guild could hold a city that had, like, good discounts and stuff, like, you could hold it by killing people within the city and making them leave. Like, they, that sort of, like, world PV... Is he, like, whistling? What the fuck? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um... Like, that kind of world PvP is really epic to me. It's, like, where you really do feel like you're making a change on the world because you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, like it makes sense. You've taken over a city, and now these people can't go there to, like, buy things or do anything, or else they're just going to get killed. And there's only, like, four major cities that are... Well, anyway, that game was, that, was, that game was really cool. And in EVE, it's the same sort of thing. Like, anywhere you go, you can be killed. You're never safe. And I love that as well, but... I love that right up until... I lost my cruiser, <laughs> and then I didn't like it anymore. No, that's not true. I almost got out of it, though. I almost talked my way out of I Like, some pirates basically said, man, I like you. I would let you go, but everybody else here wanted some loot, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn it. The quote of the day almost got me out of it. That's funny. No, EVE is awesome. Like, EVE is a really good PvP game, but it's like... Hard for people to play, I think. So that's probably why people don't play it. Because you're a ship, think, and you're not like how, a person. How long is how long has Eve been out? Oh God, two thousand three. Two thousand three. I, and I think, think every it's really long. They've just been updating it over and over again all the time. I think yeah, I can honestly expansion. say, every year I've tried to get back into Eve, and I just can't. <laughs> oh I, man, the thing is, it it requires so much of you. Like I, if if I was really to enjoy the game. I need to spend a certain number of hours per week playing it. Otherwise, I just wouldn't enjoy it. I can't. You can't play it casually, really. What Unless, are you talking about? Why does everybody say that you can't play Eve casually? You can play Eve casually. I log in like maybe once a day, not even. That's my point. <laughs> you have to play for a certain number of hours a week. I mean, well, but but I. I mean, I don't have to. I'm just saying. Like, I know. I know you don't have to, but I couldn't enjoy it. Unless I was really getting into it, I mean that, that that's it's you got can so play much it as to often dive as you want. into. Like you I can play you it can. casually or you can play it hardcore. I mean, there's tons of people who log in every day and play all day. I mean, ops can take upwards of like four hours, but you don't have to do that. So I mean, you can play it either way. True. I mean, I think that can be said for almost any game, but I think I think what Bridget was more or less kind of trying to say was because of the learning curve, you really need to put the time in to learn the game and to actually. To be good at the game, you have to put that time okay. in, I yeah, guess. Yeah, you have to learn how to play it, yeah. Right, so, I, I, I mean, enjoy... I guess that's more what he was saying. Not in the sense of, well, if you want to play the game, you have to pay for, like, 50 hours a day or 50 hours a week, excuse me, you know. So. No, I mean, it's, it's, I understand that, it, that there's nothing stopping me from playing it more casually, but I would not enjoy it as uh, enough, like, opportunity cost-wise. Okay, I've got some leisure time right now. What would I want to do? If I if I was playing Eve casually, it would be lower on that list than if I was playing it more, you know, proactively, um, and and it was taking the the lead. So, 
The problem is I like playing other games too. So when I was, at, there was like a part of like last summer, I think I, I tried joining um, the 101st uh, Space Marines. Um, and that was a really cool experience, but it was only a cool experience because I had the time to dedicate to it. If I, if I had decided to, to stop for a while and play, uh, you know, Left 4 Dead with my wife, um, you know, this week and then play Team Fortress 2 with my friend next week, um, you know, during the times that I have in the evening, because I only have a couple hours each night to do something. And sometimes it's watch a movie, sometimes it's go out, sometimes it's play this game, sometimes it's play that game. And so the problem becomes, you know, I don't have that much time. I'm not really sure, like, what you're... I think you're misrepresenting Eve. I mean, that could be said about any game. You might not have the time to play it. I wouldn't say that Eve no, is one of the games... No, because I can play Team Fortress business. 2 as much as I want, but it doesn't get any less fun because I play it less often. Okay, so you don't like Eve, but that doesn't mean there's a problem with Eve. I think it's just that you don't like it. No, I didn't say there was a problem with Eve, but it's so freaking massive that I can't enjoy it unless I'm playing it more hardcore. So you're saying the game is too massive for you to enjoy it. Yes. So that's kind of saying that there's a problem with Eve. No, oh, there's a problem with me because I don't have enough time to dedicate to it. <laughs> but you don't need to dedicate a lot. Of, well, it's fine. Whatever. You don't like Eve. That's fine. I do like Eve. That's my whole point. But you point. don't need to dedicate a lot of time to be able to play it. That's all I'm saying. And yes, I am an Eve fangirl. No jokes. I know that you don't have to, but it gains something when you can when you can pay attention to all the the interesting things that are going on. When you can dedicate the time to keep up with everything that's going on in the world and the politics and all that stuff, it gains something that it doesn't have if you play it more casually. Like I love taking the time to like you know go into the Eve uh, what was the e, not Eve Mon but the Eve fitting program. Um, EFT. EFT. Fitting, totally. I love going into EFT and sort of like trying around different fits and going, oh man, maybe if, when, when I train this in three weeks and I'll be able to fit this thing and make this ship and all of that stuff outside of the game too. And, and so that, but that takes a lot of time and I liked doing all that stuff. But if I don't have the time to do all that stuff, then the main game itself loses some of its, some of its charm as well. Um, I don't know. That's just, that's just how, how I am. I've always tried to get back into um, back, back into it, but there, there was only one time where I really tried to get into it because I recognized that I never actually had fun with the game when I was just playing it by myself. But when I joined a corp for the first time, that's when it was really, I, I knew that was actually where the interesting thing was going on. But joining a corp takes dedication. You can't just show up sometimes. I mean, there are maybe some corps that, that don't take things seriously, but those aren't the ones that I want to be in. Well, I'll tell you how my alliance works is, uh, like, if you watch even one of my Skyrim videos, you'll hear pinging sometimes in the background, but basically what it is is there's a bunch of people on IRC, and if something's happening, they'll ping, and they'll say, everybody get online, or whatever, uh, this is happening. Like, if you want to come, you can come. So then, if I have the time, or whatever, I'll log in, join the and go. So it's, like, really just at my, at my leisure, and if there's no pings, then I don't really need to play. I can still chat with everybody in my uh, alliance and stuff, and it's very, it's fairly casual. And the alliance I'm in is extremely serious. Hmm. Interesting. It's a lot of fun. And it's easy. And, and, and if I don't log in for a week, I can set a training skill for the sets, uh, you know, sets me training for a week and I can go away and not even have to worry about it because my character never can always keep up. You know, it's not like, right. that, like that thing in WoW where, you know, if I stop playing for a month, it's like I have to go farm a bunch of gear to be able to like or level up another five levels or ten levels or whatever it'll be and eve it's like you just kind of keep going you can keep going if i leave as long as i just keep resetting my queue like once a month or whatever my skill queue i can come back and get in anything yeah and participate i mean i, I like awesome. a lot of the systems in eve the the one thing that i don't like is is the immersion of you have to fly everywhere and you have to take a long time to get there oh, <laughs> they I, don't you know, have the convenience uh, factor you can like you can, you can get a, a, you can jump, like just get, use a Titan bridge. <laughs> but I, I guess you wouldn't really have a Titan Some bridge. Some people can. I can't. <laughs> when they have access to that, I mean, there's jump clones and there's all kinds of other stuff. But again, most of those convenience features you have to grind to, to get to. Sort. Of. I mean, it's not not really grind, but in order to set up a jump clone, you have to fly out there the first time and then do it and it's expensive and it costs a lot of stuff i mean i'm glad that those all things are in there but damn it still takes a lot of time to get to those sections 
<sighs> I mean, I kind of wish that you could, I don't know, it, it would kind of break the universe, because the whole point of being able to... Um... It's just, it's only you'll bash on Eve, and it's like, people will be like, oh, it's so boring, or oh, you can't do this, and oh, you can't do anything on the first day, and it's just like, oh, like, no, you can, I swear to God, you can, and I try to, like, tell people, like, no, it's actually really fun. If you get over the clunkiness of the controls, and you, you know, start to delve into it, I mean, it is, it is an amazing game. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I want to go play some tribes. And my friend just came online. Wahaha, <laughs> tribes is a good game. Anyway. Yep. So, uh, thanks guys for being on. And uh, provide some good, uh, some good discussion. Um, and, uh, it's we'll... just me right now, so, but thanks. Oh, what happened? Oh, or you mean the, uh, the chat people, yeah. Oh, that too, I guess. Um, thank you, chat thank people. Thank chat people for sticking with us this whole time. <laughs> I, where'd Aku go? How did I miss him disappear? I don't know. But anyway, what I'll say is, Guild Wars 2 will probably be like my fantasy MMO. Like I kind of want to replace WoW, but EVE Online will always be in my heart. It's a very different. I don't think you can even. I mean, it's really <laughs> difficult to even compare them. Uh, EVE is is a sandbox MMO. It's very different from a theme park MMO. I guess you could say. Yeah. And Eve is just... It's all, like, player-driven. There's no, like, story, you know? I mean, there's sort of story. Like, you can go read, like, why you're there and stuff, but it's, like... Yeah. All right. All right, I'm going right. to turn off the stream here. Ciao. And uh, thank you very much. We'll have you on some other time. Great. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.